the co-founder and managing partner of Speciale Invest. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Vishesh Rajaram. Good afternoon, guys. Firstly, <clears throat> doing a session after lunch, I thought was a hard one. I think doing a session after what he just did, I think is incredibly hard. You know, it's not a bad idea if you actually hang out here for the rest of the talk. <laughs> thank you again. A uh, big thank you to Mesilio for actually allowing a VC to come and talk a founder story. And, you know, most people think VCs are mythical human beings, and I'm here to show that we're just normal human beings, just like everybody else. And most importantly, we're founders ourselves. A uh, little bit of background about us. Uh, I represent a fund called Special Invest. Uh, we're a deep science and tech VC. We believe in supporting founders to build a future. We work across health and bio. We work across climate and sustainability. We work across beyond earth and space. We work across manufacturing tech and artificial intelligence. We've been fortunate to have investors who believed in us and we have about 500 crores of capital. And most importantly, been very fortunate to work with about 70 plus founders across about 40 startups. <clears throat> a little bit of what allows us to do what we do, it just goes back to who we are and a little bit of our own story. Um, you know, I, um, I grew up in a regular middle class family here actually in Bangalore. My father was an entrepreneur from 1983. I spent uh, time in manufacturing plants between age seven and age 17 watching him build pharmaceutical companies. So right at the back of my mind, DNA was that you actually build things, right? Um, that's what home was for us, and that's generally how our mentality worked. At 23, I lost my father to cancer. I, I inherited his company. Um, no founder market fit. He was in pharmaceuticals. I was a finance grad. at 70 employees and a lot of debt to manage. The interesting part in life is, you know, failure teaches you a ton of things. We failed. I, I mean, I couldn't build the company. I was very lucky to, you know, sell the company, exit engineer it, and come out clean. But learned a ton of different things along the way. My co-founder, Arjun, who's a classmate of mine from business school, also did two startups, failed at one, but ended up building one of India's largest B2B travel tech companies on the second time. So our big belief is, you know, as a founder, you may not get it right the first time, but, you know, as they famously say, it's not about winning the battle, it's about winning the war. We believe entrepreneurship needs a lot of empathy because it's extremely hard, and, you know, the odds of success is just that much low. And hence, the team that we have at our firm, we're about eight of us, are largely founders ourselves or have built companies who worked at young companies. <coughs> the last piece deep in us is just the resilience, right? We've all, somewhere in our lives, failed miserably at what we've tried to do. We've always come back to say, there's just another day to go back and build. And deep in our firm, that's exactly how we think about ourselves. And that's exactly how we think about the founders we work with and the kind of companies that they're building. Like I said, we, we, we invest in deep science and tech. And one of the reasons we invest in deep science and tech is, you know, inherently believe that value creation actually comes from nonlinear innovation. And nonlinear innovation comes from deep insights that someone may have about something. So we try to put down a slide that sort of helps summarize the approach with which, as a founder, we think about who we partner with, who we provide capital and support with. And this is actually a line that we borrowed from Peter Thiel, and it goes about to say that what is this revolutionary truth that you know, you know and that most people don't know or don't agree with, right? Which essentially means there's something deep that you know uh, that the rest of the world disagrees with you and, there's, and then there's an opportunity for you to do something nonlinear. I'm going to pick up an example. <clears throat> in 2016, I actually had a cold LinkedIn email from two founders from BMS in Bangalore. And, um, you know, they said that uh, they wanted to build two-wheelers for India. Their belief was most uh, OEMs uh, were actually doing facelifts and they felt that they wanted to build a company ground up. What intrigued us the most was just the amount of work that they'd done on design, quality, engineering, on the product itself. And, you know, we, we fell in love with them and we decided to invest in them. Today, they're, they're India's best-selling EV motor bike company. 
Um, they've won numerous awards. They've raised capital from Qualcomm, from Ferrari's family office, from TVS Motors, fairly well-funded company, and they're actually going global. They're going to Europe next week. And, uh, and you know, like most other traditional OEMs, they're building for the globe from India. The big insight that they had was that 2016, the incumbent OEMs weren't ready for EV, and they didn't really think it was going to come at the pace it came. And they believed that they should come up with a product ground up than doing a facelift, right? That's what led them to build a successful company. The second piece often is, you know, what is this truth? I mean, of course, there's a, there's a lot of truth out there. You could read a lot of research reports from great consulting firms, but the idea is that this is a truth that nobody else knows or most people don't know. And that sort of truth or insight is going to come from, you know, micro levels on, on the ground. So going back to ultraviolet, <clears throat> this was a full stack EV company. We built our motors, we built our controllers, we built our BMS, we built our battery packs all in house. And one of the big things we learned about battery packs is that the biggest limitant for performance is going to be how do you manage heat? Or how do you do thermal runways at a, at a battery pack level? And there's only so much you can optimize at a battery pack. You have to also optimize at a cell level. At this point in time, there aren't that many cell manufacturers in the country. And then we ended up meeting two PhDs, one from Michigan State and the other one from IIT Bombay and Ruki. And they both had worked at Aether. They both had worked at Log9. And actually, the two of them are right there across watching me speak. And their belief was, you know, you have to use a combination of physics and materials to find a way to solve for heat. And they've taken a proprietary 3D approach to, to making cells that are far more heat resistant, thermal management runway. What all of that means is from a customer standpoint, you could do fast charging, you could you know, work out in Wellore, in Madras, in great heat environments and still not have safety issues as far as the battery pack is concerned. Now for a company like this to even come up, they ought to have gone through the cycle of having worked at Aether, having worked at Log9, but they made cells. And having understood that the current cylindrical cell approach or the prismatic cell approach will not solve for heat beyond the physical property of it to be 2D, and then they had the insight to do 3D. This is not something you'll find in a research report, right? This is something you learn from the ground. Our third belief is that often you want to use this truth or this micro to go and intercept a large market. So we did two wheelers, we did cells, we realized that lithium is here to stay, of course, because it's taken 10, 12 years for lithium to come down to a price where it's acceptable. But we also believe that lithium is not going to solve all of mobility's problems. We do believe that at some point in the next decade, hydrogen will be a viable solution. And one way for hydrogen to be a viable solution is to actually bring down the cost of producing green hydrogen. We actually have one of our dear founder partners here, Roshan, he's going to go up later and talk more in detail. But uh, these are, again, two PhDs, one from an electrochemistry background, the other one from a thermodynamics, th thermodynamics background, that came up to say that they'll build a certain type of electrolyzer that's very efficient in producing green hydrogen, but also very cost effective. And they have a vision to get to $1.50 for producing green hydrogen per kg very soon. And that will disrupt green hydrogen mobility in this country. <coughs> The last piece that we also think about is, okay, there's a truth that you know, it's come from a micro insight, it's a large market, but the big question to ask is, why are you uniquely positioned to do this, right? And that's important because you need to be in an environment where you at least have the talent or the industry or the maturity of one of the two for you to go out and build a large company. And an example to give in here was, you know, our, our foray into beyond Earth and space. We were early investors in this sector back in 2018. Um, the insight that we had was, you know, in other parts of the world, uh, while they had strong space research, research organizations, privatization had already taken off, specifically in America. We thought something like that was on the onset for India to happen, and we felt, I mean, we all know that ISRO is one of the best space research organizations, so there's a, there's a fertile environment for us to build a company like this. And we were early investors in a company called Agnikul Cosmos. They 3D print engines in 72 hours as against six months, and hence are able to give rockets to satellite manufacturers very quickly. This then led us to spend more time 
on the space environment, talk about rockets, talk about satellites. And then we started to realize that the world of satellites was filled with companies that were building a single resolution satellite, which meant they could either give you an X-ray or they could give you a photo, but you know, Earth has a lot of clouds around it and, and hence a photo can only do that much good. And insight from that came to create a company called Galaxy Space. This was set up by founders who built India's Hyperloop pod out of IT Madras. And they're essentially building a satellite that can do sensor fusion on the edge, which can give you very context rich images of Earth and help, help understand the health of Earth. And <clears throat> having spent time with rockets and having spent time with satellites, we very quickly realized that there will be a ton of satellites that are going to go around Earth. And you want to start thinking about how you maintain these satellites and how do you bring these satellites back. And then that got us to work with two professors out of IIT Bombay who now turned entrepreneurs. Uh, and they have this big vision of building cities in space. They're, they're anti-mask and more like Bezos and they feel that you don't need to go to Mars, you can build a city you know, a few hundred kilometers away from atmosphere and still survive there. But of course, the, the short-term <laughs> goal is more to more to build capabilities of, uh, of repairs and maintenance in factories in space to, to repair and maintain these satellites. So I hope in, in, in this we've managed to give you a little bit of flavor on you know, how we go about thinking about science and innovation and how we go about investing in them. Our big learnings, I mean, it's just half glass full, but the good part about half glass full is as long as the glass is getting bigger, you know, you've got more water to drink. Uh, so I know a lot of the times people talk to us about deep tech and they talk about you know, there's not enough capital for it, and you know, I fully agree, I'm not gonna argue that. But the only saving grace is after having talk, spoken to people in Japan and North America and Singapore, it's, uh, it's the same situation everywhere. Of course, the quantum of capital is different in different places. But the real way to think about innovation and, and capital is to think about risk. And when most people think about risk, they think about risk top down. I mean, you could always think about risk and say, why would you build an EV OEM company and there are four big companies in this country, you can never build one. Or why would you build a rocket company? Israel's been the only one that's done that. But then you want to also start thinking bottom up, which is <clears throat> what's the minimum amount of capital that you need to build the first prototype? What's the quickest way to get customer validation? What's the best way to get an LOI for the rocket engine? And then you start breaking down risk into compartments, and then you try and match that with capital. So a lot of our time then goes about when we look at companies, especially the ones that are you know, on the deep science and tech side, is to really think about capital and risk and then going hand in hand. And how do you mitigate risk at every stage of capital? Last thing, you know, I've been in venture now for the last 16 years. I've been investing since 2007. Um, haven't seen a better time than now. Um, you know, the biggest thing going for us beyond the fact that you've got great talent, beyond the fact that you have capital, is I think India is now being recognized as a global technology provider beyond you know, pharma and IT services. We're now being seriously taken as an alternative for great technology products. And we've been very fortunate to work across EV, climate, synthetic biology, drug discovery, um, quantum technology, and robotics as well. And in a lot of these cases, you know, the big positive momentum, especially in the last three years, is that international customers and international partners are looking at India with a lot more respect, with a lot more credibility. So my big takeaway and a message that I want to leave with, with all the founders out here is I think there can't be a better time than now to build from India. And, you know, think global. Don't just think India. Think about building for the globe from India. That's all I had to say for today. Thank you very much.